Hello, my name is Christina McTai, and I am a librarian and program manager for the marketing department here at LA County Library. Tonight, I have the honor of introducing you to our speakers. Leading tonight's conversation is our county librarian and CEO, Sky Patrick. Sky was appointed to her role in 2016. She is responsible for the library's 86 libraries, 15 vehicle mobile fleet, and resources that are used by more than 3.4 million customers across LA County. In addition to helping LA County Library go fine free and initiating several other services that break down barriers for our customers, Sky launched the library's I Count Equity Initiative which ensures that library services and programs address the needs of LA County's diverse communities. Under Sky's leadership, LA County Library received the 2023 National Medal for Museum and Library Service, the nation's highest honor given to museums and libraries. Sky continues to reinforce the library's role in the community as a civic and cultural center a hub for public information and services, and an institution of literacy, access, and belonging. Tonight, Sky will be interviewing Amina May Safi. Amina is an award-winning author of four novels, including Tell Me How You Really Feel, This Is All Your Fault, Not the Girls You're Looking For, and Travelers Along the Way, a Robin Hood remix. She is an erstwhile art historian, a fan of Cholula on Popcorn, and an unironic lover of the Fast and the Furious franchise. Girl, same. Her writing has been featured on Bustle and Salon, and her award-winning short stories can be found in the anthologies Fresh Ink, First Year Orientation, and Out of Our League. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Amina. Welcome, Amina May. How are you? I'm great, Sky. How are you? Yes, thank you, Christina. Doing good. Before we get started, I'd like to take an opportunity to read our land acknowledgement. The Los Angeles County recognizes that we occupy land originally and still inhabited and cared for by the Tongva, Tectavium, Serrano, Quiche, and Chumash people. We honor and pay respects to their elders and descendants, past, present, and emerging, as they continue their stewardship of these land and waters. We acknowledge that settler colonization resulted in land seizure, disease, subjugation, slavery, relocation, broken promises, genocide, and multi-generational trauma. This acknowledgement demonstrates our responsibility and commitment to truth, healing, reconciliation, and to elevating the stories, culture, and community of the original inhabitants of Los Angeles County. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work and live on these ancestral lands. We are dedicated to growing and sustaining relationships with native peoples and local tribal government, including in no particular order, the Fernandino Toctavian Band of Mission Indians, Gabrielino Tongva Indians of California Tribal Council, Gabrielino Tongva San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians, Gabrielino Band of Mission Indians Quiche Nation, the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, and the San Fernando Band of Mission Indians. Once again, welcome to LA County. I, this is one of our virtual programs. We're really thrilled to have you here. I have tons of questions for you. I've been reading about you all week and uh, oh, am gosh. very- <laughs> I'm like the child of an immigrant. I'm like, you can't embarrass me except by saying the things that I've done. And I'm like, oh, hide me. Well, don't hide. <laughs> Today is your day to be out and out, out and about, so to speak, virtually. Thank you. So we do have here a QR code on our backdrop uh, for those who are listening. Just if you want to find out more about what the county library is doing in regards to banned books and censorship and a myriad of programs we're offering in and around the subject and the freedom to read. So please do take a look if you have any interest. So of course, we just heard about 
uh, several books and novels that you've written, including Not the Girls You're Looking For, which is such an intriguing title. <laughs> this is All Your Fault, which of course I love that as well. Tell Me How You Really Feel and Travelers Along the Way. Let's, let's hear a little bit about your journey as a writer. How did you know you were going to ultimately become a writer and what kind of drew you to this? You know, as we grow up, we have all kinds of hopes and dreams, but the fact that you've written several books says to me that this is a pathway for you. So we want to talk about that a little bit. I would love to. Thank you, Sky. I feel like I have like two diametrically opposing answers to this. The first is like, that childhood self, right? When I was a kid, I was always telling stories. And I think some of that comes from my dad is from Iraq. Arabs in general are very much like steeped in an oral storytelling culture. And if you have anyone in your family that like can make anything a story, you know what it's like when it's like going to the grocery store is like an, yeah, like everything. And the way my dad taught me anything was a story. Yeah. Like, so like there was just this embedded storytelling, my dad, my grandfather, my aunts, like on that side, everything felt really epic. So I think I was just steeped in that, in like that storytelling culture really young. And so when I learned to read and when I learned to write, I started telling stories. Like there's this, I was thinking about this answer and I was thinking about this, like I wrote a ghost story when I was in fourth grade and it was serialized and I would like read it to the class, like literally every week. And like, un it's it was bonkers. I've refound it. It was like, it starts with like, everything you know about ghosts is wrong and let me tell you the real story like it was just so bold I love that oh just so like so confident like I got my brother to blurb it I'd like clearly seen that books had blurbs and I was like 10 and I was like my brother this is a good book like this is a good story older kid you know like very important that an older kid liked it so I'm very savvy a very savvy 10 year old and then there's like the other side which is when I was in my young adulthood and especially in my early 20s of trying to figure out, you know, what to do for a living, how to have a job, what what a career looks like. And I think by that point, I'd realized that I was just really different than a lot of people and I didn't have the words for it. I do now things like I'm dyslexic and I'm ADHD and I know why my brain is so different from other people's. Um, but I didn't have those words at the time. I just felt like I was constantly trying to perform normal and coming up short um, and I think there was like a lot of fear in being a writer. And I think I tried to find any job or any career, um, that wasn't being a writer funny enough because I was trying to, you know, the road to your fate is, uh, along the road you spent avoiding. Yeah. Like that. I, I always mess up that quote, but like, it's like the road to your fate is on the road. You try so hard not to be on it. Um, so I tried everything and I thought I can be an art history professor. I can work in the arts. I can, work in other people's stories and I think I was still so much of art history is really the story of of other people's stories like because you're studying art and art is about all of these other stories we tell and I am still obsessed with that by the way it wasn't like a bad path for me but I was in the middle of grad school when I started the book not the girls you're looking for because it was something that I could write about and it didn't need research. And I wanted something that was mine, that was an academic. Um, I knew what it was like to grow up in Houston, Texas. I knew what it was to be mixed, to grow up in an interfaith household. Um, it felt like something I could speak to and speak to those kinds of stories I loved about growing up and growing into yourself without having to you know, do that bulk of research, which by the way, I love and comes up later and say um, travelers along the way, because I did so much medieval research in that point. So it wasn't like I never got to use it again, but yeah, I think there was the part of me that as a kid was like, I'm great at this. And there's a part of me as a young adult that was like, this is actually terrifying. And can I do anything else? But yeah, I started in grad school and I guess the rest is history. <laughs> so to speak, I love so speak, I love what yeah. you said about uh, art history specifically, because I also started uh, this journey of examining other people's stories through art history. I love um, that. I've never really thought about it that way, but when you've said it, a light went on because I often call myself uh, not the CEO of the library, but the keeper of stories. I feel like that's yeah. really what I'm here to do is ensure that stories are being told and accessed and, you know, delivered. So that actually brings me to my next question about your books and how the girls in the stories really are looking to discover who they are and in, mm -hmm. in, in all the arrays of who we are. One uh, of your stories, uh, which takes place in an indie bookstore, and 
it goes back from, fr I was going to say frenemies, but enemies to lovers. And then, of course, you have the retelling of the Robin Hood story, which we'll get into a little bit. Is there a through line that connects the different genres and settings in your work? And the reason I ask that, because I, as I researched you a little, I did see one through line between at least two of your books where one of the characters uh, was really invested in sort of the plight of poor people, poor, and I interpret that to be minoritized in some way, shape, or form. Do you find a through line to, with your books and characters? I do. I love hearing what other people find because like what you see in yourself is always different than what someone else sees, right? Like the the selfie was always of scare. That's why I think it's always funny when people are like, who are you in there? And I'm like, do you trust me? I'm a fiction writer. Do you trust my opinion on myself? I mean, I, you know, I've done the therapy, I've done the work, but I don't know, bold, bold of you to trust me on this. But I think that's so interesting because that's probably true. There's probably like a little core of of people who care deeply about justice and doing the right thing. I think I probably bring that quite accidentally all the time because I love I love people who are trying to do the right thing. I love people who are choosing to grow into their better selves. I think that that's really hard to do, but I think it is the work of a lifetime and particularly a time that happens when you're a young adult, which is why I love that age. For me, the thing that always pops up, and that's why I love the the Fast and Furious reference in my bio too, is like, I think I, I always come back to found family in some way, form or another. And I do think that that comes from being the child of an immigrant and having someone really intentionally build family and watching him especially watching my dad build family in Houston with you know people he worked with with people who were aunts and uncles with people who were in the Arab American, Arab American community there and then also made sure that there were still connections in the diaspora so like staying in especially before the internet there were times where we couldn't get calls back to Iraq or we couldn't, you know, reach everyone. They ended up moving to Jordan. I was able to see them kind of from 14 onwards, but like keeping a diaspora family connected and the work that took and the humility that took was something I don't think I appreciated as a child. Cause you're like, they just acted real messed up. Like, why are you tolerating this? Why are you holding everyone together? And I now know what like a sheer force of will it is to hold a family together and like not let that not let geography and chaos and war and invasion come between people, which it is very fair to happen. So yeah, I think found family comes up a lot and the ways in which we choose family and even the family we're given, we choose them. And what does that work look like? I think runs through a lot. I think chaotic heroines also, I love to write. Um, I think that they they're able to change in a way that's always really interesting as a writer because if they're a little chaotic themselves they they show a great elasticity when chaos enters their life <laughs> right they don't get brittle they, they 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 learn to adapt with it they learn to react to it they learn to take action they don't always take the best action um the first time or the second time but I think that those are characters that I see as having potential for growth because they're not afraid of chaos and they are sometimes agents of chaos, but sometimes they learn to harness that and use it for good. And hopefully they kind of learn to use their better selves throughout that. And I think those are things that I find interesting, no matter what, whether it's a rom-com, whether it's a historical adventure, whether it's a coming of age novel, I think that those are things that I'm always interested in um, and that always come up. When you were speaking, I was meditating on this idea of chosen family, and that is always uh, that always resonates in sort of queer identified yeah. characters and narratives because many times, you know, you're required to find your own find your, your own family. tribe, yeah, yeah, your own family, build, build your own family, and build your own support network, and it takes like such a sheer force of will to do that. That's right. That's, <laughs> it's no, that's so much labor. Right. <laughs> yeah. And there was a, there's a character of yours and I've now, I, her name escapes me. And I think it's tell me how you really feel where one of the reviewers say that she's kind of a chaotic and not necessarily sympathetic character until you hear her voice, until you hear her speak her truth. And then there was an opportunity to sort of resonate with the character. Otherwise, told from the other character's point of view, she was chaotic and not as forgiving or not as open, I should say. Yeah. Do, you think, do you think that's accurate? 
I think that can be. And I, I would say what's so interesting about that is even without knowing which character they were talking about is that was one of the fun parts about writing This Is All Your Fault is that I was in three characters' point of view oh, and they all, all saw each fault. other mm -hmm. differently and they yeah. all had their own baggage with how they saw both themselves and others. And right. I love that moment when you think you know who someone is and then they show you who they are. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's like you see it, you're like, oh, this enormous piece of context that I didn't have and I filled in with my own experience. And I, I and usually when you do that, you put like your worst your worst assumptions, right? You put your right. worst self in that person and in that slot and you assume the worst in that person. And this is very normal. It's a very normal human behavior. And that was what was so fun about writing multiple POVs is that you get to break that down and you get to break that down externally and you get to break that down internally. So you get to mm. break that down for the characters seeing each other and being let in. And then you also get to be in the character's perspective when they realize what it is to let someone in. And like, that was sort of the, the fun craft bit yeah that was the fun craft bit of point of view is like everyone thinks they know what they're looking at and everyone's point of view is coming with their own baggage and their own bias and their own perspective and the way they've moved the world and many ways are valid and many ways are are missing what the other person has so that's why it was fun to kind of have these girls who all thought they were enemies or all thought they knew you know you're this person i'm this person we are incompatible versus you give someone a common goal and suddenly they have to work together and fun chaos and suicide. <laughs> it, it sounds like a recipe that we need in this current environment. Yeah. We'll get there. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of your characters. Your characters are often faced with personal and cultural challenges, which yeah. I think is one of the one of the things that really draws us to your writing. For instance, Lulu and not the girls that you're looking for is trying to navigate her cultural and her family expectations. And coexist with her own self-awareness and where she wants to be in this world how do you balance these elements with humor and romance because honestly when you think when I think about young adult books they they're often very heavy and you know because you're piecing together who you are as you're peeling off the layers to see who who you're becoming and yeah. so it's not always that you can also have humor. Um, like that, that's a hard balance to draw. So yeah. let, let's hear you talk about that a little bit. Uh, I love this question. First of all, I always say that with romance, I think I just, I love love. I love love in all forms. I love, you know, romantic love, platonic love, familial love, just all, of, there's so many forms. And I think anytime I get to write about love, I'm just very engaged because I think, it's a piece of hope and it's a piece of connection. And I think we as humans are social creatures um, and there's always a push and pull between the individual, but we want to exist in a community and we want to know what that means both to maintain ourselves and exist in that community. And I think love is a really big piece of that. And I know that's very cheesy, but I'm a cheesy, cheesy person, um, super cheese ball. And then I think the humor, I really do like, I have these two aspects from my parents and I think one is my dad's side and, um, this is very Iraqi American. I think I've also noticed this in other like people who are Irish American. And I think there's other groups that are like this as well. I think this doesn't just belong to Iraqi Americans, but they have a really dark comedy. They have a really dark sense of humor. And it was like definitely a way of coping with so many things beyond your control. When you're talking about dictatorship, war, invasion, you know, my dad would laugh and find humor in things that were bleak in order to cope. And my grandfather would do that too, right? They they would find, like my grandfather was someone who fought for democracy in Iraq and was imprisoned many times as a political prisoner. And he used to say he was a guest of the Iraqi government. <laughs> right, like that was, yeah, like that was his way of just like, he was like, I was an, an unofficial guest. I was an, a guest of the Iraqi <laughs> government, mandatory guest. <laughs> they didn't oh, let me okay. Out. Yeah. Um, so like there's that aspect. And then there's the other aspect of um, my mom is really funny and she's really witty. And she's someone that I always admired. Like I have this very early childhood memory. We were in a beauty salon and especially if you're, I'm from Texas. So like in the South beauty salons were these, especially in the nineties, very strange nexus of like, my mom was a professional working woman. Like, you know, I am a career woman. There was also a lot of like ladies getting their Barbara Bush set, right? Conservative, I guess the updated version. Um, and then a lot of gay men working in salons. So you had these like 
my mom kind of going like women have this like beauty standard they have to live up to and I'm outsourcing it to, to deal with right like this is how I deal with the double standard is I'm outsourcing it so I can focus on my work you had women who were like this is my job is to be good looking and like be on my husband's arm and then you had a lot of queer men and my mom would tell these jokes and I could tell and I was a kid so I didn't understand all of them right like there's that Neil Gaiman quote of like kids have this a wonderful ability to not understand until they do until they're ready um so a lot of the content of the joke I missed, um, but she's very good at saying like really raunchy comedy uh, that like makes you laugh. And she would do this and I could tell that the gay man in the salon always felt seen by the kinds of jabs she was like throwing. But then I would watch these conservative women. I mean, you could tell they're conservative just from like the way they set their hair. Like they hadn't changed their hairdo in God knows how long. And they would laugh. And like, I saw there was such power in comedy from watching her that you could, you could be on the side of someone, especially in again, 90s AIDS crisis. Like this is very like, we're at the tail end of like the Bush years, the first ones. <laughs> um, so like, I could just see that there was power in comedy. And I remember watching her and being like, I want to be funny. Like, I want to be funny like that because it's, it's bringing people together, but it's also being subversive and it's also taking power away from the people who can normally punch down. And it's including people in ways that maybe, you know, when your client is a conservative woman and you're a gay man in Texas, you have to bite your tongue in this scenario because like you want to keep being able to pay your bills, right? Like there's like all of these things. And I could understand much of that, even though I didn't know every single layer as a kid, but I could process that. So I think there's the like, you know, child of an Iraqi immigrant, like we laugh to keep from crying. And there's the like, there's really power and humor that I watched the way my mom was able to wield it, especially with people who otherwise, you know, really would have turned their nose up at whatever idea she had packaged in this like funny thing. And so I think I'm always trying to marry those ideas together. And I think comedy makes things digestible and it makes mm -hmm. it makes the heavy bits something you can handle because you were able to laugh and experience catharsis as well. So you're like, okay, I laughed instead of cried. I let it out. And then I can also yeah. keep dealing with these heavy things of growing up. Mm -hmm. I like this idea of the, uh, I was going to say the barbershop, but the beauty shop being sort of this confluence of cultures and communities. And I hadn't really put that together in my mind that you have this potentially ultra conservative, you have working class women, you have career women, yeah. gay men, all in this building, in and around creating this concept of beauty. Mm -hmm. And so there, there is a lot of layers in that statement. I hope you tease that out. I think there's a story there, but Probably, you didn't yeah, ask but me for that. So, no, I love it. No, but it is. It's so interesting. Yeah. To think about all of these bodies yeah. together and like you have to socialize now. <laughs> That's right. That's and you right. have to sort and of believe. vaguely keep the peace and not because no one wants to get in a fight with rollers in their hair. Okay. That's right. <laughs> and you want them to come back. And mm -hmm. you, you know, you mm -hmm. build, and then it becomes a very interesting sort of community of trust. These women yeah. have to trust these men to, you know, make them look however they think they should be looking. So it's, it's, that's a really interesting moment. I hadn't yeah. ever really put that together. So thank you for that. Of course, yeah. Uh, let me ask you another question in and around race and, and background. I think this is uh, an important conversation. Oftentimes we hear writers say something to the effect of, I write about what I know, and that could be interpreted in many ways. Um, your book features a cast of diverse characters and, cult and cultural settings stretched far beyond your personal background, or is that true? Maybe you can correct me on that. Why do you think it's important to have these elements in your work? I think the the easy short answer is always that that is the way the world around me looks. Los Angeles is a vibrant and diverse city. Houston is also, you know, the most diverse city in the country. I think that I've grown up surrounded by multiple languages, multiple faiths, multiple cultural identities, multiple racial markers. I think that like that's the way the world looks. That's the way it is. Multiple abilities. Um, you know, I'm neurodivergent. I think that not including that feels dishonest and it feels 
you know, some piece of the artist's job, in my opinion, is to tell the truth, right? You're wrapping it in fiction, you're you're putting it in a space of play, you're putting it in whatever fantastical world or real world you've imagined and in, in these characters you've created. But ultimately, I think it's your job to be, to tell the truth and, and make yourself uncomfortable as an artist to like put it on the page. And it feels like that's not the, it would not be the truth to to not include that in some way. I think there's also the piece of me, I am, you know, I mixed, I grew up in a multi-faith household. My mom is mixed. I grew up on a lot of languages. I grew up on people who spoke multiple languages, lived in different ways. I think that the idea that you are only one thing and that there is some purity and identity, especially the idea of like you're purely identified as one thing is to me a really fascist idea. Like the idea that you are this one thing, you belong in this box, don't step out of it and I've coded you, your taxonomy is done. Like that doesn't even work for like, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm an aunt now. Um, you know, I, I'm i a runner. I uh, Sometimes you take up a new sport, you're like, what if I wanna be a pickleball player, right? Like, and those are like silly, right? But like, these are the ways in which we identify and you're never one thing and no one carries one thing. And it actually was something that really powered travelers along the way because we have this very singular idea of, medieval Europe right like we have this and I love Lord of the Rings but like we have this like very Lord of the Rings idea of, of the medieval world and it's like also very Game of Thrones where it's like even there you're like you're basically getting medieval to Tudor England and like some we throw in a little bit of Spain and we throw in a little Italy and that we vaguely in a really disturbing way that reference North Africa and that's kind of it and then we tap dance over it and the medieval world was incredibly cosmopolitan and it was incredibly global especially when you're talking about these sites of civilization in Western Asia and North Africa. West Africa was the gold capital of the world, right? Um, I can't even speak to the trade networks that were happening in the Americas because I don't know them as well, but they were all the way north to south, intense like trading networks, like the way we think of the Silk Road. I just don't know it as well as I do know going you know, east to west along you know, Western to Eastern Asia. You know, East Asia had its own hubs. Like there were these civilizations of cities that were cosmopolitan they were already global like humans kind of tend towards globalism they tend towards interacting and it's so vibrant and we think that this is a modern idea or a modern problem and it's not it's always how we've trended because people seek out people and i really wanted that to be in the past and in a story so that people could see that and see who could have existed all at the same time and we believe stories in a way that we often don't always understand in the way we teach history. So I thought it was really important to have people be able to imagine that in that world um, because it was real and more real than the, like everything was the same. Um, cities were always vibrant and, you know, even, even medieval England and Tudor England had people of color, right? Like, yes, like, there was people were kicked out for for their skin color but there were like anti-black laws in elizabethan england so like no, there, or right. go there were black people in, in elizabethan england right like that's right that's it <laughs> that's right it's interesting that you talk about sort of this this idea of allowing people and 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 by extension characters to evolve i think that's a really hard concept for people you know yeah. just even as an example you meet someone meets you 15 years ago and they meet you today and it's like oh my god you're different yep <laughs> I would you hope changed. Right? That's, yeah I would hope yeah. <laughs> yeah and so that leads me to think about your work and I wonder I often wonder for writers like when you posit a character when you create a character and then you go back maybe five years later and you read it do you read the character the same way do, do you feel about do you feel the same about the character or has the character evolved because you've evolved? Well, that's interesting. I, I I don't know that I have a direct, this is so interesting because I'm a rereader of books. Like as a reader, I reread and books change as you reread them. So like I, I've experienced that's this. That's exactly as a, what I'm getting to. <laughs> yeah, no, like as a reader, right? Like um, I reread Pride and Prejudice since I was like 11. And every time... I am different. So the book is different, right? The first time I read it, you, it was really the storyline and the romance. And then the second time I read it, it was the the social constructs and the the manners and the status of women. 
And then the third time I read it, it just started to be really funny. Like, like the comedy was really landing probably just from an experience of like the history wasn't in, like inherent to my brain at that point. And so like, I was just sort of laughing at these, like, like the random cross-dressing in the middle of prior, like it always gets, I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot that this happens in the middle I, of this. I actually forgot about that. Yeah, it, every yes. time it's kind of like, I'm like, this is really funny. Like, and the way she writes about it is really funny. And then it becomes a, like, you get older than the Austin heroines and you kind of start to, maybe not even nostalgia is the right word, but you start to look back on the choices you made and how young that character seemed when obviously someone who was 20 when you're 11 seems very old and grown up. And I've had that as the reader. I have never, the one book I've reread with enough space was Tell Me How You Really Feel. And I narrated the audiobook and... I have changed as a writer and there's ways that I wouldn't phrase certain things or I think there was a couple times where I caught myself writing around something rather than getting to the heart of it which was an interesting thing to see and I was like would I still do this or would this character do this right like is this character am I writing around this because this character is avoiding their feeling or because I was avoiding a feeling like I don't know <laughs> but it's an interesting question because you always change and I think that's the beauty of storytelling is that it always exists between the artist and the audience and the audience always plays their part in bringing who they are in that moment to that story um that's it I love it the yeah. audience is always bringing it's it's a, it's a relationship between it is. the writer yeah. the story and the reader I and love reader. it yeah. yeah I was listening to you a little bit earlier and you said something that struck a nerve and I think it was Nina Simone who said something to the effect of it's the artist's responsibility to tell the truth or to yeah. expose the truth or something along something. those lines. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure that's hearing, where I got it. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if it was, <laughs> I don't know if it's that she was the first person, but that's where I, that's where I locate that, that, yeah. that thought. Cause I watched the documentary. So I know that's in my brain somewhere. I think that's, oh, that's like that. a wonderful documentary. We should talk about that one later. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Sidetrack. <laughs> Let me ask you this one. Why are you being banned? And let's talk about being banned and yeah. what your feelings are around that and why do you think you're you've been banned you know my feelings are are very much in this childhood place of did your parents have a a thing that like it didn't matter like there were some things you could get away with but if there was like a line and if you said this thing you'd be in real big trouble like I know a lot of people like god damn oh, yeah. like yeah <laughs> like oh, you yeah. yeah so my mom's line was shut up like you cannot and I didn't even say to her let me just like this memory is visceral okay like this memory is visceral I think I said it not even to my brother to one of my brother's friends and my mom heard me somehow from upstairs like classic mom hears everything in the house and it was just like get your butt up here right now and I just remember like do you think you have a right in a free society to tell someone to shut up you don't and my mom's a lawyer so she was like literally giving me a legal argument <laughs> like I'm seven and eight or eight and I'm just like this is horrifying you're right I don't think I have a right like, you don't have the right to tell someone they can't talk I mean she was a 12 out of 10 on that like I I think I could have dropped like an f-bomb and I would not have been in as much trouble as I was for shut up and so it hits that place of like someone's telling you to shut up and someone's telling you to shut up in print which feels even more violating in that way there's always the part of you that's hurt I think and hurt in this place of like someone's silencing you someone's telling you to shut up someone's telling you you can't speak in a and again in a free society in a in a world where we've agreed that like this country we have free speech and we have the ability to speak out and then they're making laws that you can't I'm always baffled by the urge and I think it's because I like to stay curious. And I think when people ban books, they're coming from a place of fear, right? They're not coming from a place of, I don't get it. Let's have a talk, right? And then again, that's from the like childhood center of like, you can't, if you can't tell someone to shut up, you have to ask more information, right? Like you start, it starts a dialogue because instead of silencing someone, you, you reach out and you talk to them. Um, or you say like that hurt my feelings, right? Instead of saying, shut up, you say, I am hurt, um, right? And you have a conversation. Whereas when you 
when you ban a book, when you tell someone to shut up, you're you're shutting down a conversation. You're shutting down a dialogue. You're coming from this place of fear. It's very obviously coming from a place of fear. And you're you're banning interaction. And like that's dehumanizing both parties, right? Like that's dehumanizing the angry person, the fearful person, and it's dehumanizing the person that doesn't get to speak their stories and from their side it's just it's just an immediate shutdown and that's really hard to watch and that's really hard and it feels anti and little d like anti little d democratic right like like we live in a democracy for a reason and uh, I think it really does hit that like idealistic button of mine and um, libraries are a place of access and they're a place where you know not everyone can access information for any number of reasons and shutting down that access is it's difficult to watch um yeah. it's, it's upsetting it's, um, and this is a, this is a very precarious moment we're in historically books have been banned since you know since sure. antiquity right we yes. all know that or censored yeah. in some ways or some way yeah. or another but you also likely know that at this point in time there have been more book bans in this last since I think the numbers since 2018, since the McCarthy era. So we have reached a precipice and it is critical. There are more laws outlawing books, LBGTQ rights, uh, anything having to do with quote CRT. And so like, as you think about your work and you contextualize your contribution to the art, to art and to literature, Why do you think you're being banned? Why do you think these books, you know, often it's, it's under the guise of protecting youth under the guise of protection. Protect our pearls and protect, protect the children. That's right. Um, Why do you, why do you think this is happening? I mean, you said it was fear, but. I think there's fear. Yeah. I would also say like badly written laws, first of all, like enable, I was looking at the statistics of this and like, this is how my brain works. I was looking at the statistics of this and it was like 600 of the ban requests in Florida were requested by two people. And like of the 1100, like, I think there was like, maybe the Washington Post got a hold of a thousand and like 60% were done by across the country were done by 11 people. So badly written laws that incur criminal responsibility onto educators, librarians, like school districts, have real world consequences that this very small organized minority can do this to so many books. And like, that's what I find them the most disturbing. Like there's, there's also the fact that like they are predominantly banning queer books that tell queer stories. 49% of books are either about BIPOC characters or queer characters, which especially when you're taking effect, how few books in publishing are published about (laughs) queer and BIPOC characters like that's that right. math starts to get real wonky real fast that's right. um i think that it's a combination of people targeting books that are that have what they've decided is queer content whatever they've decided is about race in some way or form and using the guise of the idea of protecting children or and I think that the this is also because the, the laws that are badly written are about educational settings and public education settings. So it enables people to take advantage of that. I think what really disturbs me is that that combination of it's really it's such a small number of people when you start breaking it down that are. I think so far this year, like 4000 book bans have been logged or yeah. challenges have been logged and and they're publishing lists to like send out to other people so like nobody's reading these books anymore like they're just publishing lists of books they've decided are objectionable you know I'm assuming based on titles and covers and what they can get of content um and most of that content is you know you have a queer character or someone dealing with you know coming into their identity or someone who deals with moving in a body that's black or indigenous or a person of color Um, well it's it's really interesting the um uh, maybe an unintended consequence quite frankly a lot of people are reading those books the more exposure a book gets the more audience 
typically a book gets. And so quite the opposite is happening with all of these bands. They call it the Streisand effect, by the way. So let, let me just, let me socialize this idea. It's uh, Barbara Streisand, apparently when, you know, the internet was like getting bigger and people started using it to find the homes of rich and famous people here in Los Angeles, which there are thousands. So many. She apparently had her team block out her house <laughs> so that no one would know where she lives. Well, of course, you know, what we now know is trolling. Everyone figured out where she lived and then of course put it on the internet. And so just drawing attention to herself. But anyway, there is there is a theory behind it. It's called the Streisand effect. But okay, let me ask you this question. Um, so you're, you've kind of already answered this, but why is it so important? Why is this moment? So we are in the 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 month of book banning and freedom to read and libraries and supporters of libraries and, and supporter people who support intellectual freedom. We're all banning together, pun intended, to really talk about and create a space of safety around books and content. Why is it so important to you? Oh, I mean, there's the, you know, the big idealistic part of me that really does believe in the project of democracy and, and does believe, you know, America's not perfect, but it's worth striving for the ideals we set out. And I know that that does make me an idealist, but I do believe in that. I also think reading... Again, it's it's part of that interaction between artist and and reader, right? Between storyteller and reader, and what you gain from reading, what you gain from entering that space changes you, and it changes how you see the world. It changes how you move through the world, and often not in the way anyone can predict. By the way, I think it was the author of of uh, Fantastic Creatures was talking about how it's uh, it's bad manners to give children a clear moral, um, which I agree with, right? Like you want kids to think for themselves and be able to adapt and be able to grow. Um, and I think fiction is such a beautiful space of play. And it is a space of play where you can safely engage in all of these things, right? Like in, in people who have a different identity marker than you and people who love differently than you, people who live where there's dragons and like, what would I do in a world where there's dragons? Would I dive into the dragon? Like, sometimes you're like, I would. And then you're like, I would not. Like, mm, I do not mess with dragons, right? Like, I don't know. Like, I don't mess with like ghosts. Like anytime someone's like, get out the Ouija board. I'm like, I am out. Look, I've seen this movie. I'm done. Like I have played this scenario in my head and I know what happens. I'm not here for it. I don't mess with it. But dragons, I'd be like, yeah, let's go. And <laughs> I don't know. But like those spaces of play are so integral and we are storytelling creatures. Like we are hardwired. I read this years ago and I feel so bad that I can't remember who it was, but it was the arts are not frosting, they're baking soda. They're integral to who we are and how we learn and how we grow. And when you tell something like a story, it it becomes a way of understanding the world, right? Like astrology was a way of literally telling the story so we knew how the sky would move across a year. And taking that away is, it makes the world dimmer. Like it makes the world dimmer to take those stories away. It makes everything less bright and it's important to have access to things, even if you don't like them, right? Like, I don't love Hemingway. I'm glad I read one, right? Like, I'm look, I read one. Actually, I had to read two in class, okay? I read two. Likely two, yes. Like, it's two. Yeah, I was like, it was the two. I'm sorry. Old Man in the Sea and the Sun Also Rises, okay? Yes. Not for me, but I know that. And I'm like, I hope we get exposed to things outside of that, too. But, like, there is no other way. I probably very likely would have been exposed to what it was to live through the first world war like mm -hmm. that was that is my access point for that better or worse and like understanding pieces of the early 20th century that have other pieces thank goodness because again i wouldn't want that to be my only entryway into that but i think that that's really important to think about is that like stories are really important to us and silencing voices because they're different than ours or they've experienced the world differently than ours just just makes the world dimmer and it it makes you less able to cope with the inevitable change and chaos and you know shifts that happen in the world it, it right. ill equips you 
I, I often say the book banning and limiting what people can read, you lose perspective, right? Yeah. You have the, the library of all places has a myriad of perspectives and that's all it is. Yeah. You decide whether or not you want to read it. You pick it up, you can put it down. Just that simple. Yeah. So you can try I, it and not like it. That's all right. That's right. And that's, that's absolutely. <laughs> you cannot like my book. I'm okay with it. <laughs> that's that's absolutely right. But it will be on the shelf, right? Yeah. So you have the ability to make a decision. Let me ask you a couple other questions, and I want to get to make sure I reserve a few minutes to open up the chat. So, what advice would you have for an aspiring young writer? Not even a. Let me let me correct myself. An aspiring writer. You can be young in your career and not, and not be young in age. Um, 100%. Toni I, Morrison wrote her first book at 40 years old. 100%. Yep. I've told so many writing students that. And I think Maya Angelou didn't start writing until she was in her late 30s. Like there's writing is one of those things that the more experience you have, I think the more of a wealth of wisdom you bring. And I think that that is an asset in writing um, that is really special about writing and making art in general. I was about to go like on a tangent of my love for Faith Ringgold and like watching her illustrations and art, but I'm sorry. I, this is my, my brain. Yes. My advice is always buy and share, write it, finish it. Like, I don't care how long it takes you. Like, I don't care if it takes you two years. Like it doesn't matter as long as you keep going. If you have half an hour, one hour, once a week, sit down, keep going, get all the way to the end. Because once you have something, you finished it. Finishing it teaches you things that no other thing, no other teacher can teach you other than getting all the way to the end and being uncomfortable. You have to go back and edit it, but like keep going until it's the way you want it to be. Do you have a writing discipline? Do I have a writing discipline? Yeah, because um, you were saying just now, like sometimes it's an hour, sometimes it's half an hour. What's your discipline? What's my discipline? It's actually been changing because I recently realized I'm dyslexic. So I've just started learning to use my dictation tools and it actually mm -hmm. does make me faster. Um, but yeah, drafting was always really difficult for me. It really taxed my brain. So my discipline was always very much like I would write and then I would write. And if I had a really good writing day, like if I got a whole bunch of words down, I would need several days to like recover uh, mentally, mm -hmm. like the the mental strain of all of that text. So I was never someone who was like, I knew people, they were like, I sit down and I write 1300 words. And then I wake up the next day and I write 1300 words. And I'm like, cool, I write 200 words. And then two days later, 300 words. And then five days later, I wrote the 6,000 words. And then I couldn't write for a week. But like, if I say I'm going to show up, I show up. If I don't have it that day, I do other work that's either research or other storytelling work and stay engaged in the mm -hmm. sort of the thought of the project i often think of oh i just lost the name of the um is it ishiguro who wrote a remains of the day my brain oh just, somebody oh, throw it in the chat please fix my please fix me my brain just like can't find the file i i um, see the book yeah I'll i know and so you can see it in your i just really don't want to say it wrong but that's how he wrote the remains of the day it was like he spent several months researching then he spent a year just letting it percolate. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ishiguro, Kazu, Kazu. Yeah, I was like, right, am I, I going like, to slaughter you. that? I'm like, gonna am not, I going to mess I'm gonna up? Oh, it. I'm going to okay, embarrass. Please, you. someone correct me on how Christina. I'm supposed to say this. Um, <laughs> and then the whole book came out in four weeks. And I don't know, like everyone works differently. So I think learning to figure out how your brain works. I tried to be a right everyday person. It didn't work for me, but I'm really glad I tried because when you try, you learn something about yourself. So mm -hmm. show up to the project. Don't give up on it get all the way to the end. The business of writing will shift. I found my agent from, you know, DV Pitt on Twitter and Twitter isn't even Twitter anymore. So like, I'm not saying you, like there are always going to be new opportunities. Like the old ones will be gone, but the new ones, especially in this like very fast moving internet world will come up. So That's like right. the fact that there was Twitter pitching, like you used to have to go in person to a conference and pay for a conference. So like, I think that those accessibility points are actually getting better. They're just going to change. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm get your work to a place you're proud of it, finish it all the way, then worry about selling it, but do the thing. Don't give up on yourself. So I have to ask you this question that I have to get to all of these questions that our audience is asking. I ask everyone this question. What are you reading? What am I reading? I brought a stack actually. Um, because I I'm love always it. Reading, I've, I'm always reading a combination and not pictured is I'm also working on the, I just, 
I've read some of her other books, but I'm listening to Beach Read by em- Emily Henry. I'd never listened yeah. to the first one. So that's been great. 18 uh-huh. Roses. This is a great coming of age, especially if you love messy heroines. It's about a girl who has no friends. And for her uh, Filipino American debut, she has to have 18 friends for her party that she doesn't want to have, but her mom wants her to have. So it's like about her trying to make friends when she feels like she's really bad at making friends. And obviously chaos ensues. And Shannon Rogers' writing is just so beautiful and lyrical. And like, she's so good at capturing big feelings. So if you love big feelings and girls and their feelings and figuring out how to be friends again with people, figuring out how to reach out instead of like, you know, close off, great book for you. I just finished Yours from the Tower, which is an epistolary novel and it's historical. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm just going to put it in front of my face. Ha, that worked. So it's like three perspectives and it's um, three women in, I believe it's the late 1800s not all the way to the early 1900s and it's just them writing letters back and forth after they've left school and I love that kind of like you're getting pieces of the story my nonfiction is I've been reading uh, Midnight in Cairo um, the roaring divas of Egypt's 20s so it's about the ways in which Cairo's nightlife kind of blew up in the 1920s it's the ways in which I always find it really interesting because there's like the heady intellectual feminist movement. And then it's all of these women on the ground who are working as actresses, who are starting the the first film publications, who are working in the movie business. And like the Egyptian movie business was like the hub and the heart of the Arab language movie business. So or and still is. But um, like when you say an Egyptian ending is like that's the Hollywood ending um, to Arab speaking countries. So it's been really cool to see all of these women who were living and walking the walk and not always in a fun way, but like they were on the ground living this life. And it was very cool. And my dad just sent me this. So I'm excited to to dive in because it's about bad behaving crusaders rather than like acting like the things they were doing heroic when they were, you know, like, you know, bragging about wading in people's blood and um, sort of like toxic masculinity gone awry during the crusades. Cause it was a lot of, you know, men with swords just dehumanizing other people and like probably going to be dark, but I it's just want thing. to know that I think you just threw up five books. So you read several books at once. I am also I do. I do. guilty. You can't yeah. see it, but I have a sh- I have a whole stack of books here that I pick up, read a chapter, put it back down, yep. pick up another one. It's just mm-hmm. how it is. Yeah. And then um, like once so you, get, we drop- you hit a tipping point and then you like you dive through that one and that one gets finished and then you probably pick up a new one. Or I actually end up having to start over because I've taken so long to get through and then I forgot where I started. <laughs> so we have actually dropped all the books here in the chat that she mentioned. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. And of course, I'm running out of time. Do you have any plans to adapt any of your books to TV or film? I've had stuff that's often but not gotten past that. So I mean, okay. obviously, it'd be very cool. Would love that. And I, I would love to work on that all the way through. But yeah, some of that's just like out of my hands in terms of the number of people that work on this. My cat is demanding attention. Do you want Do you want to be on the Zoom? <laughs> Come on in. I was hoping my dogs didn't start barking. So yes, yep. there's, there's yep. enough room for the fur babies. <laughs> um, okay, so not yet, but not yet. to be not continued. Yet, but to be continued. Uh-huh. Yeah, how do you decide on the titles for your books, like as an example? This is so fun. Also, a fun fact about titles is everyone puts them in all caps in emails as a publishing industry standard. So you'll get like titles in your title. And because mine are all kind of aggressive, it's just like all caps. This is all your fault. And it's like cover. But like, you don't get that. You just see like, this is all your fault edits or like, (laughs) tell me how you really feel about our marketing plan. Right. Um, So that's always like a fun little detail to like picture a all something in all caps and think about how that reads in an email it depends on the book you often work with your editor my first one we pulled a line from a scene where one of the girls is talking to another and she goes these are not the girls you're looking for so she's like kind of doing the jedi mind trick and yeah so it's kind of like she's making a reference my second title took like a hundred mad lib title I tried to be and my editor were going back and forth on that I think I found a list of it and it was just like there was just a hundred different options all over the place it was it was like doing word poetry on the fridge trying to figure out the title though I'm really happy with how it turned out but um word poetry I do too but (laughs) after a while it starts to feel a little like you're like have I turned into word salad I'm not sure that's right anymore that's right (laughs) Here's a question from the chat. How can books help people deal with some of the traumatic experiences they've endured? 
how can parents and caregivers give support in their care with books? If you have any suggestions about that one, maybe the first part. I think the first part is very much books can help people feel like they're not alone. And sometimes books can give words or scenes to experiences that maybe, especially as a young reader, you didn't have context for or you didn't understand. And I think that's why books can be so powerful at that age is part of it, they can help you understand something you went through, or they can help you understand something a friend went through because you felt like you were on the outside of it. And I think that that can be really powerful. Yeah. And then I think with, with kids, it's always depends on the kid on like what they need and what they can handle. And if there's someone who does better in text, if they do better with visual, like I'm someone who just as an aside, like I read the news even though, or I, um, or I listen to it uh, via like a AI generator um, called Speechify, because if I watch the news, like it, it's too emotionally intense because I'm a visual person, right? So it's like the emotional intensity is really hard for me to watch the news. And I feel like it's also like kind of done in a way that's very emotionally heightening. Whereas like, if it's just text or if it's just the sound of the text, I'm like, I can process this and think it through and understand it in a way that I feel comfortable with. So, you know, like understanding the kid, I think is always so important to like what they are emotionally ready for, which is different by a kid, what formats work for them, audiobooks, graphic novels, novels. I think like those are also really important things that I think sometimes we don't think about when we're thinking about like, how do you yeah. support someone while they're reading? No, I love that you mentioned that because it is one of those sort of barriers that we're still attempting to overcome that graphic novels are perfectly fine. Audiobooks are just as fine as reading the book as, you know, so we, we get kind of caught up in this reading culture and maybe one day we can sort of chop up how my thoughts of why that is. But I have to end. I can't believe we've already been here an hour. No. I have like five more questions to ask you, but I cannot. But this is what I'm going to suggest. We are pulling together a writer's festival here in uh, Los Angeles County, and we would love to have you back and talk a little bit more about your process, about some of your insight and some of the work you've done to really have these characters come alive. Uh, one thing I want to say here, we do have someone named Max Lyon who is in the chat, and he is saying that he is reading Disability Intimacy uh, edited by Alice Wong, and he highly recommends it. So I certainly thank everyone for joining us. I want to thank Amina, Amina May Safi to, um, for joining us tonight. We have opened up Pandora's box, and hopefully we can have her come back and, and do a part two. Yeah. Thank, you, thank so you so much. much. This is so great, Sky. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll see. We'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Take care.